Does your drumming sound tired, lifeless, dull, and unimaginative? Do you ever feel uninspired or that you're playing the same old licks over and over again? Well, if you've experienced any of these things and you're looking for new ideas to add color to your drumming, stick around because we're going to check out a bunch of exciting, creative, and challenging ways to put it all together. I'm Rod Morgenstein, and I'd like to spend the next hour with you talking about some of my favorite drumming techniques and concepts. I think you'll find most everything interesting, useful, entertaining, I hope, and easily adaptable to your own particular style of drumming. Before we actually get into it, there's a few important points I'd like to make. First off, when you're learning something new, have patience, take your time, work at your own pace, Miracles don't happen overnight. Things will come in time. Also, when you have a pair of drumsticks in your hand and you're behind the drums and you're getting ready to play music with other people, think like a musician. The drums are one instrument which perform a certain function when you're playing music, but there are also other people playing other instruments and those instruments also perform certain functions. So you need to be sensitive to everything that's going on. So keep your ears finely tuned and open at all times. It's also important to keep a real positive healthy attitude. Take criticism well. Lots of times what other people have to say to you uh, can be really important and actually be very good criticisms. Uh, and finally, it's really important for a drummer to have a good sense of time and be able to play in time. So I think it's a really good idea to spend a bit of your practice time with a metronome and or a drum machine as these devices can really show you where you have tendencies to drag a beat, slow it down, or rush a fill. And they can help you correct these problems. All right, with that behind us, let's get down to business. First thing I want to talk about is versatility. What is it? Well, to me, it means feeling really comfortable playing in a lot of different styles of music. Two things happen when you're a versatile player. One, the doors open up to all kinds of playing situations, and two, all these different styles that you are comfortable playing have a very interesting influence on each other and they in turn can help you develop your own individual sound. Now all my life I've been into a lot of different kinds of music. Fortunately so have the musicians and bands that I've played with. And if you've ever seen the Dregs or the Steve Morse band you know what I'm talking about. We do our own blend of rock, jazz, country, bluegrass, funk, fusion, whatever. So when I practice I try and spend a bit of my time playing through a lot of different grooves and feels and a lot of different styles. And right now I'm going to give you a very condensed version of what that might look like. I'm going to play two different grooves. First a blues in 6-8 followed by something a little funky. And while I do them I'm going to think time, feeling, uh, and I'm also going to think like a musician and 
part of thinking that way means I'm going to do drum fills in such a way that they might happen in songs. So here we go, beginning with the blues feel. A couple minutes back, I had mentioned that all these different styles can have an interesting influence on each other. Well, what I mean by that is maybe you can do some really interesting uh, experimentation by taking part from one style and mixing it with a part from another style and come out with something brand new and unique sounding. What I'm going to do to give you an example of that is pound away on the double bass, play a backbeat on the snare which is all very rock oriented, but with my hand on the cymbal, I'm going to play a Latin mambo cowbell pattern, which sounds like this. And when I put it all together, we have the following. I actually heard a beat like this on a heavy metal record, and it sounded incredible. Now, another thing that uh, I think is really interesting is that a lot of different styles of music, which don't really seem like they have anything in common, actually do when you think about uh, what goes into the drumming. And to give you an example of this, uh, I'm going to bring in Jerry Peak, bass player who I play with in the Steve Morse band. He's going to help me out. We're going to play four different uh, grooves beginning with a traditional jazz type thing, followed by a Latin uh, thing, then a country style thing, and then followed up with a double bass shuffle. And notice how my, my pattern on the cymbal is always the traditional jazz ride pattern. That's what's going to uh, link them all together. One, two, one, two, three, four. <laughs> So, versatility. Listen to and practice as many different styles of music as you can and become a well-rounded drummer who can cover any musical predicament that you're faced with. Uh, it would really be a lot nicer than you know, being offered a gig and then having to say, oh, I can't do it because I can't play in that style. Well, we've seen that you can do really interesting things by taking elements from one particular style, crossing them with an element from another style and come up with something new. And I also tried to show you that styles which don't really seem that related actually have common things between them that do make them uh, similar. So,
cover all your bases and be versatile. One of my favorite techniques is using ghost strokes. Now a ghost stroke is basically a very quiet tapping of the snare drum, like this. And believe it or not, this tiny tap can work wonders on all kinds of beats and fills. Let's start with a basic rock beat. But instead of using both hands to play the hi-hat and snare, do it all with one hand. If, uh, if you're a right-handed drummer who plays in the conventional manner, do this all with your right hand or your writing hand. I'm a left-handed person, I play backwards, I'm crazy, don't let me confuse you. Use your writing hand, like this. Now what that does is free up the snare hand, okay? If you're right-handed, it means your left hand. And now we're going to fill in the holes, all the 16th notes, really quietly, using ghost strokes, with that hand. And that sounds like this, just the hands very slowly. Three E and a four E and a one. One. Three. Four. One. Now let's add the bass drum. Two, three, four. Now, once you get this down, uh, then you ought to try some different eighth note patterns on the bass drum and then expand to some uh, heavy sixteenth note patterns. Now, another beat that works really nicely using the ghost strokes is what I call a rock march. It's also a right-left, right-left, hand-to-hand pattern of single strokes, just like what we did. And uh, it's just counted as triplets, like this. Three and a four and a one. Now I'll add a bass drum pattern. One, two, three, four. With this particular beat, since it has such a, a march quality to it, I sometimes like to mix up the ghost stroke with double ghost strokes, which is a double tap, which in rudimental terms is called a drag. Uh, very slowly, that sounds like this. Three and a four and a one. Three. Four. One. Three. Four. And now with the bass drum. Two, three, four. Okay, another beat that the ghost strokes work great with is a shuffle. Here's a shuffle without ghost strokes. To put the ghost stroke in, keep your hi-hat hand on the hi-hat, and you fit the ghost stroke in between uh, the first triplet and the third triplet, like this. Three and a four and a one. Now I'll add a bass drum pattern. Two, three, four. And while we're on the subject of shuffles, how about a halftime shuffle? Here it is without ghost strokes. To add the ghost stroke, put it in between the first second and fourth triplet, like this. Three and a four and a one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And here comes the bass drum. Two, three, four. 
Now, going back to the original rock beat that I was playing, uh, you can start to get a little creative by not just hitting the 2-4 backbeat with uh, your right hand. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Two, three, four. And then also think about maybe fooling around putting some accents in on your ghosting hand. And uh, this can really help you come up with some pretty neat funk stuff right off the bat. Here's one example. Three E and a four E and a. Now I'll put the beat in. And now, just to give you an example of how the ghost strokes can lead you into all kinds of neat stuff, listen to this fairly simple beat in 4-4. Now I'm going to do a bunch of things. I'm going to start with my ghost strokes, singles and double ghost strokes, and I'm going to use some of the other things that I have available to me in the drum set. Maybe open the hi-hat, an occasional accent with the ghosting hand, maybe use a couple of tom-toms and the offbeat cymbal pattern. And the beat I'm about to play is all based on the simple one that I just played for you. Two, three, four. So all you have to do is use your imagination, working with the things that you have around you, beginning with the ghost strokes. Now, in terms of doing drum fills, uh, quite often when I'm playing, I, I'm not really thinking about what I'm doing, but I'm playing all sorts of random single and double stroke combinations. And along with that, I'm accenting a lot with my main hand. Occasionally, uh, my other hand, which is ghosting most of the time, will stick in some accents. And uh, let me just play a little bit of that for you. Now, when I was doing that, I had an inner pulse going, and I knew I was doing essentially 16th notes. But I wasn't really thinking about what I was playing. Probably, uh, for all the years I've been playing, I've gone through a lot of books that have random single double stroke stickings, like stick control. And uh, when you start applying them to the drum set, it, there comes a point where you don't really think about it anymore. But just to show you how many possibilities there are, Let's work with one fill. It's going to be um, an eight note pattern. And the sticking will be right, left, left, right, left, left, right, left. OK? Right, left, left, right, left, left, right, left. And remember, I'm left-handed. I play it backwards. OK, here are some things you can do. With your main hand, your riding hand, your right hand, you can accent. Okay? And in accenting, you can do that on the snare or the tom-toms, like this. Three and four. And if you noticed, my other hand was ghosting all the time. Now, something else you can do is displace some of the notes. 
Uh, this next example, I'll displace one of my accents with the bass drum, and that would sound like this. Another thing you can do, randomly accent with your ghosting hand. For this pattern, since I have a single stroke on the last note, that's where I'll put my accent, like this. <clears throat> and finally, another thing I do is sometimes double my main hand with the bass drum and play a lot of it on the cymbal, like this. So now, using this one pattern, I'll play all these different things for you. So, when you think about all the single, double-stroke, random combinations that there are, uh, it boggles the mind in terms of how many different textures and sounds you can get on the drum set. Now, there's one other thing I wanted to show you. At the very beginning of this section, I played a linear kind of beat, and by that I mean I was only hitting one source at a time, either the hi-hat, bass drum, or uh, tom-toms. Part of that beat went like this. Two, three, four... And as you can see, ghost strokes work out really nicely with this sort of thing. Now, I don't really know how I come up with patterns like this. I kind of just fool around on the drums and uh, fall upon four-note patterns that feel good to me, and I go with them. But uh, just for the fun of it, I'll play this one slow, slow down for you uh, so you can maybe figure it out. Three E and a four E and a one. We've been talking about ghost strokes. There's a lot of things you can do with them. You can dress up all kinds of beats and fills and uh, really make them sound great. So learn to control them, put them in the right places, and you can make a lot of ordinary sounding things sound really, really special. If you're a fan of rock music, progressive rock, heavy metal, um, hard rock, fusion, jazz, any kind of music. If you ever watch TV and you hear the music, if you listen to commercials on the radio or TV, if you've ever been to the movies and heard a motion picture soundtrack, chances are you've experienced odd time. Now, playing in time signatures other than 4-4 can be a real challenge and it can be extremely exciting. It can give you a whole new way to think when you're playing and it can really increase your understanding of how time works. Now, the best way to get into understanding and learning how to play odd time is through 7-8 time because of its relationship to 4-4. Four, four. In one measure of 4-4 four, four time, we have eight eighth notes. One and two and three and four and. If you take one of those away, you're left with seven and we count it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Don't say seven. You might be uh, counting in four, four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So just say sev. Now, at the early stages of the game, the counting is the most important thing. So let's take this sort of simple four, four beat and turn it into seven, eight. First in four, four. One, two, three, four.
All right, we're going to leave off the last eighth note. We're left with seven of them. And if you can count to seven, and without stopping, start it all over again, you can do this. So here we go. This 4-4 four, four beat now in 7-8. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Come on, count. All right. Once you get this down, and remember to keep counting, then you should expand your bass drum patterns, do all sorts of eighth note patterns, and then move into all kinds of 16th note patterns. Now, to get into soloing and doing fills, I suggest play a beat like this for one measure, and then for the next measure, just play 7 eighth notes on the snare drum, and then maybe move it around the drums a little bit, like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then, when you think you have that down, start to uh, gradually expand your fills a little bit. Maybe still doing eighth notes, but then leaving some notes out, and then working in uh, some sixteenth note patterns, and use uh, all your stuff. Like this. I'll start simple and gradually build up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, you can take some of your favorite beats that are in 4-4, turn them into any time signature you like. You simply add notes or take them away. Now here's a beat that I like in 4-4. It goes like this. All right, I'll turn it into 7-8. I'll leave off an eighth note. I'm left with seven of them, and it sounds like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's the way to do it. Change a lot of your favorite beats that are in 4-4 four, four, to 7-8. You'll be on your way. All right, now, odd time can happen in a lot of different ways. An entire song might be in one odd time signature, just like a lot of songs are in 4-4 four, four all the way through. Or maybe a part of a song might be in an odd time signature, or a section. Um, There's a perfect example of a song where a section goes back and forth from 4-4 four, four time to 7-8 time. Most of you have heard this song. It's called The Ocean by Led Zeppelin. Uh, Jerry's going to play it on the bass, and I'll count it with you to show you how it goes. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, and four. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, I love that song. Okay. Now, some songs have sections where Every measure is a different time signature, and uh, Jerry and I are going to play a segment of one such song. It's called Night Meets Light. It's from the Dixie Dregs album, What If. Uh, we're going to play the bass and drum part to the last section of the song, which repeats over and over. It's eight measures long, um, and the time signatures go 4-4, 5-8, 4-4, 5-8, 4-4, 5-8, 4-4, 5-8. Six four, and now Jerry will play the bass line, and I'll count it. One, two, three, four. 
Okay, so now Jerry and I will play this together. Uh, we'll try and start simple, but then gradually have a little bit of fun with it, take it out. Uh, if you notice, um, the bass does not always stress the downbeat of each measure, which makes this even a little bit more difficult, but uh, this is some of the most fun stuff in the world to play, so let's see what happens. One, two, three, four. noises. So, get into odd time. It can really uh, help your counting, understand how time works, give you new ways to think, and um, chances are you're going to meet up with it sooner or later, so you might want to check it out now. So remember, count, 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 and you'll be okay. How do you come up with a good drum part for a song? Good question. Basically, that's going to be determined by a number of factors. One, the musicians you're playing with. Two, the kind of music you play. Three, the producer or person who makes the final decisions. Four, uh, the special qualities of the song that you're working on. And five, your own creativity based on all the different techniques that you have. Now, when I first start learning a song, I start with some broad, general information, and then I work towards more specific things. I also usually start from the bass line. Now, there's a song we do in the Steve Morse band called On the Pipe. It's on the introduction album. The bass line goes like this. Okay, I start with some general information. Bass is pounding away with eighth notes. Sounds like it's going to be a rock tune. Um, it's real punchy. It's in 4-4 time. And there's a lot of kicks. It's really syncopated. Okay, so there's my beginning information. Now, here's something that I wouldn't play. Two, three, four. Okay, but depending on the kind of band I'm playing in, uh, I would play this drum part differently. If my band was a straight ahead rock band, we hit real hard, but we play real simple, I might play something more along these lines where I let the bass and guitar do all the punching, the drums will just play backbeat. One, two, three, four, like this. Two, three, four. But the Steve Morse band doesn't play like that. We're more progressive rock fusion oriented, and we like to play a lot of notes. And the drum part I play is more similar to this. Two, three, just played two extremes. Now there's a lot of gray area there where uh, you might want to play some of the kicks but not all of the kicks. Here's something in between. 
two, three, All right, there's another song that we did in the dregs called Divided We Stand. The bass line goes like this. Okay, I start once again, gathering up some general information. Sounds like it's in 4-4 time. Bass is playing quarter notes, like this. Uh, but this one doesn't really have a straight feel. It has more of a triplet or three feel to it because of what Jerry's playing at the ends of each measure. Dum, 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 da, dum, 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 da, da, da. Okay, so now I have an idea of some things I could play. Here's a couple beats. One, two, three, four. Or I could play something like this. Two, three. But really, to me, this song has uh, a special quality to it. It sounds like a march, a rock march. And uh, so what I do is dig into my bag of tricks. I pull out my rock march, which we talked about back uh, when we were dealing with ghost strokes. And that basic beat goes like this. Two, three, four. Okay, now it's time to start dressing up this beat. First place I look to, the bass drum. Why don't I add something to it? And here's what I did. Two, three, four. At the end of the first measure, Jerry does this figure. Dum, 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 da dum. Wow, what if I change this and maybe accent with the snare and open the hi-hat there? Well, to do this, um, I also thought it would be neat to not play the bass drum on the downbeat of the next measure, and it would give this beat the feeling like it's falling over the edge. And I like that. That sounds like this. Two, three, four. Now I like to deal with the end of the second measure. Dum, 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 da, 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 da. Okay, he's playing a triplet. I like to do things unorthodoxly sometimes. So uh, I decided, gee, no one really would ever go for that middle note of the triplet. That's where I'm going to go. And so I whack the snare there. And I have to um, change the bass drum a little bit to set up that kick. And uh, I might have to change the hi-hat a note or so. And this is what that sounds like. Two, three, four. And then finally, since this song has such a march quality to it, I decide to use the double ghost stroke, or in rudimental terms, a drag. And when I put the whole thing together, I'll play it slowly at first by myself. It sounds like this. Three and a four and a. Now Jerry and I will play it together. We'll jam out for a few measures. One, two, three. Come up with a good drum part for a song. Start with your general information. Find out what time signature it's in, uh, what the feel of the song is. Is it a ballad? Is it rock? Is it jazz? Is it loud? Is it soft? Is it fast? Is it slow? And then work towards more specific things.
Playing two bass drums can really add another dimension to your playing. Now, I'd like to show you a few different ways that I use them in uh, my soloing, playing beats, and playing fills. Now, generally, when I solo and play fills, I use three kinds of techniques. First one is what I call question-answer, copycat, what have you. Play something with your hands, mimic it with your feet, like this. Something along those lines. Another technique I use involves playing around with your hands and then, at random, doubling some of those licks with your feet, like this. Now, a third technique that I use involves a continuous flow of notes, sixteenths or triplets between the hands and the feet. Now, there are hundreds and hundreds of hand-feet patterns. I want to work with one for the moment. It's the first pattern you probably work with when you're practicing double bass drums. Four-note pattern, two hands, two feet. Some people call these quads, and I love that word. Okay. Hand, hand, foot, foot. Now, if you notice, I just played at three different speeds. That's because when I'm using the two bass drums, I often like to switch gears and slow things down and speed them up. Always in time, though. Now, I'm playing both hands on one drum, snare drum. I can also do two hands anywhere I want, like this. Another thing to do is to put one hand on one drum, one hand on another, like this. It's a totally different sound. Another pattern that I like to use is a six note pattern. Either four notes in the hands, two in the feet, or two notes in the hand, four in the feet. I'll start with four with the hands, two with the feet. I'll play them all on one drum first. Or I can put two notes on a drum. Or I can put one note on each drum. These six note patterns work really well as uh, sextuplets or two uh, sixteenth note triplets right on the quarter note. Now something else I like using uh, the six note patterns for is thinking of them as sixteenth notes and working them into 4-4 four, four time 16th note patterns. So you have to do a little bit of math. How many 6 note patterns can fit into a measure of 4-4? Four, four? Well, there are 16 16th notes. I have a 6 note pattern, another 6 note pattern, that's 12 notes, and then I can follow it up with a 4 note pattern. That gives me my total of 16. That sounds like this. Uh, one, two, three, four. And if you noticed, I was employing some of the different um, voicing techniques that I've been talking about. Two notes per drum, one note per drum, and uh, you get a lot of different sounds that way. So now I'll just play a little bit and put all these three different um, patterns together. The quads, 
the triplet or sextuplet patterns, and then these six note groupings. Now, uh, as far as beats go, especially if you're just getting started, uh, you want to concentrate on getting a nice, consistent single stroke roll going. That would be sixteenths or triplets. And uh, you might want to work towards that by playing simple hand patterns over it. Maybe uh, quarter note, backbeat on the snare, quarter notes on the cymbal, uh, eighths on the cymbal, offbeat cymbal pattern paradiddles because rudiments work really nicely. So that's exactly what I'll do. I'll play a couple measures of each of those. That sounds like this. Two, three, four. some patterns over triplets in the bass drum. One, two, three, four. Now these are more or less continuous patterns because the bass drum is uh, never letting up. Duh, 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 duh. You should also practice breaking up those patterns. Probably call them non-continuous beats. Here's an example of that. Two, three, four. Okay, now way back in the beginning of the tape, I was playing a mambo pattern on the cymbal with the double bass under. Remember, it sounded like this. Well, here it is, slowed down so you can try and learn it. Two, three, four. I really like playing lots of those Latin-influenced syncopated patterns on the cymbal with the uh, cruising double bass underneath it. Now, there's one last beat I want to talk about. It. It's one of my all-time favorites because if you can get it in time and get it 100 miles an hour, it can't be beat. It sounds great. It's a double bass drum shuffle. I'm sure you've heard it. What you have to do is shuffle your feet in this way. Do, 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 do. Get the snare on the 2-4 backbeat and add in the traditional jazz ride cymbal pattern, like this. Now what I like to do to this beat is add in ghost strokes in between the first triplet and the third triplet. And these two little notes really make this beat come to life. It sounds like a lot more is happening. That sounds like this.
So these are some of the ways that I like to use the two bass drums in soloing, doing fills, and playing beats. The key to the whole thing is to use them in the right places. So for example, if you're playing a nice, quiet ballad, you wouldn't want to do the following. I think you know what I'm talking about. In wrapping things up, I'd just like to say my intent has been to give you a general overview in terms of how I think and some of the things that I find important as a drummer and a musician. Remember, when you're working on something new, have patience, work at your own pace. Things don't always happen overnight. If you're working on something particular in this tape, feel free to rewind it two or three hundred times. I've had a great time hanging out. I hope you have too. Jerry and I are going to wrap things up with uh, a rendition of Cruise Missile, which is on Steve Morse band album, The Introduction. It's one of my favorite Steve Morse compositions. So best of luck with your drumming. We'll see you on the road. Bye-bye. Hit it. Mm -hmm.